Well, actually, um, I, I wanted that this whole uh, conversation interview would be about your relationship to words and yep. music and music. Or music, not versus wor words, but music and words. And then as it started with the memory of Bob Dylan, if... No, it starts for me with uh, Kerouac. Uh -huh. Uh, it was brilliantly spoken yes. in his words uh, uh, as far as uh, awareness of vowels mm -hmm. and the color and tone and pitch of the vowels and uh, 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 clarity of consonant mm -hmm. and uh, I think that had a big influence on Dylan Kerouac did so this it was, was Kerouac's Mexico City Blues which, according to Dylan, inspired him to poetry. Mm -hmm. That was the first American poetry that spoke in his language, according to Dylan. Kerouac's Mexico City Blues. So, uh, so Dylan is the product of the era, a product of an era. Of I didn't era. say that. I said that the specific poetics mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of Bob Dylan, uh, the way he uh, handles language, partly in relation to music and which is partly in relation to the idea of poetry comes from Kerouac, according to Dylan. Not the era, but a specific line of poetry. How did you two meet, uh, you and Dylan? I came back from India, uh, in San Francisco, 1963. And uh, there was a party upstairs from the East, from the Saint, no, from the Eighth Street Bookshop. It was a big literary bookshop in those days. The Ted Willans ran, and Ted, we stayed at his house you know, on McDougal Street and Eighth Street. Ted Willans, the W I L E N T Z. Okay. Okay. You getting any rocks here? Uh, and Al Aronowitz was a journalist friend who had done a long series on the Beat Generation in 1959. They had met Michael McClure and uh, Neil Cassidy, mm -hmm. as well as Kerouac and myself. And was somewhat of an expert, specialist among journalists, uh, brought Dylan to the party. And so we met. Excuse me, the lobster. That's all right. Please, thank you. That was back in 62, you say? Yeah. Uh, no, 63. Dylan had just come from a meeting of a uh, emergency civil liberties committee. I think it was his uh, was getting an award for social concern as a singer. And he had given a speech saying that he did not have to feel that, that an art was, had any social responsibility. But he did not want to be captive of any fixed idea of social responsibility. And they were very shocked at the dinner. It sounds controversial. Because uh, they were giving the award of the year to social action. And he was saying that the artist should not be bound down by anybody else's idea of social, of social action. I think it's a story that's told in many of his biographies, but it was that same day. But he knew of you, of you, of your work and everything at that oh, time. Oh yes, he knew about my work, and he had four years earlier been uh, very much uh, inspired by Kerouac's work. Did you ever try to do something together? Like, like um, in terms of poetry and um, 
music, words and music. Did you ever sing together? Various times. In various ways. But how, how do you see him? Uh, yeah. But specifically, many years later, we got together in a studio. He had come to hear poetry reading with Peter, and he liked our improvisations, and said, let's go into a studio. Right. Nice. And then he said, you want Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I like All right. Thank you. I'll take the piece. Good. So you're saying you, t you recorded something together. You went to a studio and you did a recording. Was it, was it some of your Back text? Back in 1971. In 71. So that he was at the we peak. Improvise in the studio to see if we can improvise the song. And did it work out? How did it sound to you? We did a whole album work. Which sometimes circulates as a pirate tape called Holy Soul Jolly Raw. Holy Soul Jelly Road. The three of the cuts were later brought out in an album called First Blues by me, uh, put out by John Hammond, mm -hmm. who was the man who discovered Dylan or first recorded him for CBS. I see. And also put out my albums. One album, a, du a double album. So, that was called First Blues. The first three cuts are there. And for that occasion, I wrote a long poem, so, song. The first time, note for note, word for word, called September on Jessore Road. I don't know if you know that poem. I, I think I've heard it, but I can't recall the melody. Yeah, it's a, a long poem about, about the refugees in West, in West Pakistan, Benga, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, Bangladesh. It seems that you... I've been singing it lately. It just seems to apply. about visiting flooded refugee camps between Calcutta and West Pakistan. West pa East Pakistan? East Pakistan. Bangladesh. That's right. And so I would say that both... Then, yeah, go ahead. Before that, when he was ill, I gave him a many, a lot of books to read. When he was recuperating, Blake, Emily Dickinson, Rambo, Sappho. It feels like it answers one of the questions that the editors asked me to ask you. What would you give Bob Dylan for your birthday? If you one of those books. One of those books. Many of those books. Too. <laughs> Um, I did. There's a whole pile of books, about 40 books, back in 19, whenever it was he had his accident. 
it seems that both of you were had similar concerns about social issues and everything. It just you were more concerned with word, and he was more concerned with with the sound. I think he sees himself as poet. Yes, that, that's what I uh, was thinking of when I said at Naropa a long time ago, once you mentioned, Alan mentioned to his students, although it's out of the context, but he said that he thought Dylan was one of the best poets, if not the best poet of the 20th century, because that was part of the anthology. I, re I remind you, that was when you were putting together this anthology of the 20th century verse, and then you had Bob Dylan, and uh, I think some students mentioned even with snare, you know, sneering like, why, what is Bob Dylan doing in here? Oh, I don't think they really sneered, no. I think they were surprised yeah, that yeah, I included surprised, it, right. but sneering, no, I think they really liked the idea. As far as I know, I think they liked the idea. That was an opening of a new field. I mean, the, like the beginning of performance, performance poetry, because no one did it. Uh, I think it became extremely popular in, in early 80s, late 70s, when John Jordan, or Laurie Anderson, and people like that started really performing. But I think you and Dylan started the whole trend, so to speak, or very early. In the, when was that? In the 60s? No. I would put that down to for poetry reading. <laughs> that would begin in the 50s. The beginning mid -50s. of the 50s. Mid 50s. Mid 50s. And how 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 did it look like? Would one just climb the stage and try? How, how, what were the readings like at that time? It wasn't a stage. It wasn't a stage private houses, art galleries, mm -hmm. coffee shops. Nothing like these clubs today, no. no. Non-commercial. Hi. Hi, Didn't charge money. That's great. How does it look today? Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist so much today. Everybody yes, it wants does. to climb. I don't agree with you. Well, okay, there are no. hundreds of poetry readings that take place in the city that nobody gets paid. Well, poets get paid a little bit. I mean, I'm not a paid but just a little bit, even. Mm -hmm. Dixon plays and plays. But there is a, and there's a lot of poets, more than could ever get there. Today, it wasn't like that before. Mm -hmm. You mean not everyone could call himself a poet? No, I don't mean that. Mm. Not everyone considered getting up and reading. There had been an older fashioned reading of rhymed closed verse which had gotten very histrionic and worn down and trite. Then there was the influence of Whit Whitman Williams and others for vernacular, intimate vernacular, which Kerouac was very good at. The rhythms of idiomatic uh, speech as a big development in American poetry. Some European sources, like the Surrealists, and the Dadaists, and the 19th century romantic poets. That existed in San Francisco with Robert Duncan in the San Francisco Renaissance before the Beat Generation came along. Before. Mm. That was an extension of the 1948 San Francisco Renaissance, which is mostly Buddhist anarchist tendency. Kenneth Rexroth, 
So how did Dylan fit into all that? I mean, this then another layer of readings in the mid fifties with Gary Snyder and Philip Whalen and myself in Kerouac. And then the movement toward music and poetry, jazz and poetry in the late fifties. And Kerouac, Rex Roth, Berlin Getty and Kenneth Patchen practice poetry jazz. Then that merged with the tradition of American black blues, which is our greatest body of lyric poetry and folk music with Woody Guthrie, left wing radical uh, social justice. Uh, peace protest, sometimes anti-capitalist, sometimes anti-communist, uh, left wing. And that's where Dylan came in, to the folk music. And jo John Baez, right? Yeah, like from both American them. folk music. Uh, inspired somewhat by the recordings of Harry Smith, who made an anthology of American folk music in 1952 that influenced all the folk poets during the So if you add that early folk interest to the later psychedelic beat, uh, purely literary, you get a combination that influences Dylan, the background from which he comes. Black blues and deep poetry. Spontaneous improvisation is the key. First thought, best thought. First thought, best thought. First yeah. reading, best reading. Um, as Dylan said at the early, sometimes he'd sing words in the microphone and rush into the studio to write down what he'd sung and go out and do it better. <laughs> write it down. Improve it. Right there. Using the studio as a place to compose. That's why we went in together in 1971. So how, how do you see his influence on pop culture, American pop culture in, in the world? Well, I mean, start making people examine themselves, think about words, so encouraging people to actually appreciate and examine language, presenting so, mysterious but intelligent Phrasing. Like to, to live outside the law, you must be honest. That's, that's right, he said that. Because uh, I asked him in 19... Oh, I don't know, it must have been uh, 69. <coughs> what he thought his best first line was. I expected something pictorial, but it was this general... Um, Axiom. To live outside the law, must, you must be honest, is what he cited. I remember with Robert Creeley going over his lyrics and finding one line of genius out of every four. As I say, four lines of rhyme, perhaps filler, and then one surprising turn one surprising metaphor, one verse of genius. This is better than most poets. Also, he made people listen to poetry, right? I mean, For the words, yeah. Well, what was your experience now to, to leave Bob Dylan? for a second. What was your experience with your own words in music? Do you feel that 
when you combine words with music that you make people listen better to the words or, or not? Or is that like that kind of experience, audio? Well, reading out loud to begin with, delivered the poem to more conscious awareness both of the dimension of sound and by verbal emphasis and tone the meaning or the significance of the sounds the interpretation of the words that's a part of vernacular so that people take note of what's being said because you can vary your tone Right, it's almost like, I don't mean to be vulgar, but you eat this rice better, I mean the, the shame's better with rice, it's like smoother, so I, I have this feeling when I listen to music also with words, although, um, but no, but for me that's not the point, <laughs> for me the point is that the, sing, the tones of singing, or vocal, vocalization without music or with music, gives you a chance to emphasize the direction, the intention, and the significance of the words. When did you start working with music and musicians? Well, there was already a tradition which I didn't take part with. At the end of the 50s, at the end of the 50s, there was some, but I was too shy for that. You were too shy? Yeah. <laughs> to get up with a band. And I didn't know what I would say. I was afraid to have to improvise. But then, Chogyam Trungpa interrupted that fear. <laughs> he liberated you. I already begun singing mantra quite a lot as part of my poetry readings and improvising a little <laughs> and singing Blake. I remember that with Stephen Taylor, or maybe some people before. Then later was your experience with the Flash. Can, can no, that's much later. Then I did some work with the Flash. Actually, in the 60s, I did some work with the Fox. With Ed Sanders and the Fox. By the end of the 60s, I began setting, setting Blake to music. By the end of seventies. The end of the, the end of the sixties began the setting 60s. Blake. Up. And now with Blake. And that led to trying to write folk songs. <laughs> and that led that Dylan giving me a lesson in the, in the uh, three chord blues better. And that led to the recording sessions. And that led to paying attention to folk music. in understanding the blues form, the 12-bar blues structure. And that led to improvising in that form. And then you started uh, accompanying yourself on the acco Indian accordion. I had been doing that since the mid-60s with mantra. And on Blake since 68. 
written on my own song since about 69. Uh, 69. So you started with very simple forms and accompanying yourself and then made it to this huge orche orchestral thing like you did today with uh, Philip Glass, right? Mm. But then in the meat... In the However... Yeah. What was that? At a certain point, I stopped composing my own music and served as a vocalist and a lyricist. I worked with Stephen Taylor and uh, 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 as a musician. Mm -hmm. And in the 70s, he began writing music to some of my longer friends. Black White Brown. And then, what's the can I get some fresh tea? Sorry. Oh, the Sorry. Oh, Sorry. So, I'm sorry, you were saying you were, first you started working with Stephen, then where, where did this experience well, then Stephen come, began. Yeah, with yeah. Punk and Cl The Clash, when did that happen? I worked with Stephen all kinds of music, including classical, as well as um, blues, as well as rock and roll. When Stephen began set, making classical settings for longer poems, a string quartet for Just So Road. Thank you. I'll leave the tickets for it. <laughs> so, uh, then, uh, that led with Stephen to letting go of composing the music sometimes. And that led to working uh, also at the same time. I don't know what year. Um, 82 or 3 working with The Clash, whom I'd met at CBGB's, or I'd met some friends of The Clash. Just coming in and working on their, their uh, words, uh, correcting their words, their lyrics, trying to work with them, and then singing a little bit on, on one of their cuts, the ghetto defending cut. But that was their music, but they told me to make up my own words. Enlighten the metropolis, teach the megalopolis, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I sang a lot of small garage bands. The old woman band, the Stimulators, Peter Olofsky's girlfriend, Mer Denise Mercedes. Oh, wow. yeah, I remember. The job in San Francisco that a poet Mark Olmstead ran. And the Gluons, right? Gluons in Denver. Denver, yes, in the late 70s? That's right, yeah, early 80s. The Black Hole in Milwaukee. The um, band called Start in Lawrence, Kansas. False Prophets, 
I, I know them there from New York. Right? The Fugs. They just follow all the banks. The Fugs. So what, what was your experience with these bands? Mm. All about my own experience, which is horrible. We <laughs> then, in 80, uh, in 75, 76, I toured with the Rolling Thunder Tour. Occasionally reading poetry, rarely reading poetry in intermission, but uh, also playing finger symbols in the uh, climax with the uh, uh, percussion section. So how do you like it? What's your experience with these bands? It, it, it was, was fun. It, it was fun. I learned something. Not enough. Did you ever get a feeling that musicians were trying to upstage your words? No. Sometimes. But on the other hand, you know, how to, uh, Dylan was always encouraging. He was. But, <coughs> again, I was too shy and didn't know how to present. I thought I had to rhyme poetry and sing it rather than just recite it. And the few times that he tried to get me to recite to the musical background I was in, I did it, but I didn't realize that that was a very good area until I began working with Hal Wilner on this record of uh, a few years ago, few years, this last year, The Lion For Real, an album which just came out from Ireland. The Lion? Record. The Lion For Real, Lion. an album which came out on, on uh, Island Records. You know that at all? No, I don't. Okay, I, well, the, it was all, the, all the material came out on John Giorno, mm -hmm. and there was a Blake album on that. And there was a, a spoken word albums of Howell and Caddish, most all of them now out of print. Then the first blues, a double album with John, uh, John Hammond. And then last year, a, an ensemble jazz poetry album where I'm reciting. And a lot of musicians are playing behind me. They're the musicians from the Knitting Factory. Uh, Tom Waits' band, Marion Faithful's band. Oh my God. And it's I'm produced not by not Hal Wilner, who also produced an album of Burroughs Spoken right. with music and sound called Dead City Radio. Mine is called The Lion for Real. The Lion for Real. And that's got a lot of uh, uh, excellent, well known jazz musicians on it. 